Hello and welcome to another episode of Man Buns and Jesus. I am one of your intrepid hosts, Pastor Ben Elschlager, here currently in Pontiac, Michigan, but uh, pastor in, at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Lake Orion, Michigan. With me again, as always, uh, you haven't missed an episode yet, so technically it is still always. Yes. Pastor Josh Laborious. You've missed an episode. Just, just one. Right. Just one. Uh, pastor Josh with John and other John. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Josh Laborious of uh, Edgewater Lutheran Church in Eastvale, California. Josh, we're we're continuing on in the Book of Exodus, and where are we today? Uh, we are in chapter three, and if you're listening to this, you might think, "Wait a second, you guys looked at chapter three last week." Um, that's my bad. We didn't necessarily intend to, but. I thought it was relevant to the conversation we were having. So we, you know, we're going to look at this again, but admittedly with a, a different lens than last time. Because if you'll recall, uh, spoiler, I guess, if you're listening to these out of order for some reason. Um, but in our last episode, we talked about some of the obstacles that get in between people and the call between people and serving God. Um and we talked about a little bit what that can look like and how we can work together as a Christian community to overcome them. We're going to look at the call of Moses again today, but uh, we're going to focus in a little bit of a different place. So here's, here's the text from Exodus 3. Um, Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I'll turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Um, and then we, we talked a fair bit about how Moses responds to that last week. Um, but then, this is jumping forward, Moses goes back to Jethro's father-in-law and said to him, please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. Uh, and Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. So uh, to help us discuss the call of Moses and uh, especially what it looks like to kind of take on that call to lead God's people, um, we've assembled the perhaps greatest wealth of uh, knowledge that is not useful to the task of pastors you could <laughs> place in one podcast. Um we brought on today a friend of mine, uh, another golfer. I don't think we've ever really talked about golf on this podcast, but Bryce and I would golf quite a bit at the seminary. Oh, yeah. That, that would um, be the episode I would not be here for. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Um, but also a man who comes to ministry from uh, a very different context than either Josh or I. Bryce is coming from uh, a second career perspective. Uh, he worked for many years. It was a physical therapist, correct? That's correct. Um, and uh, speaking from firsthand experience, when I had some pain in my elbow during seminary, he's good at his job and he loved what he did. So we wanted to bring him on and ask him about uh, what led to this call. Um, and was it out as out of the blue as Moses hearing a voice from a burning bush? Um, and was it as easy to... Uh, to hear that call and accept it as Moses kind of makes it out to be, or was it something else? So I guess first off, just tell us the story. What led you to pursue seminary and, and pastoral ministry? Sure. Uh, going way back, I was uh, went to high school on a Concordia Lutheran uh, campus. It was Concordia Seward, Nebraska. 
And uh, uh, back anyway, when I went to high school there, they actually had it on the college campus. So I was about 90, grew, about, grew up about 90, 90 minutes away on a farm community. And we had a group of six of us that a pastor had encouraged to consider either going into um, secondary education, either come, going to become a teacher, or become a pastor. And at that point, I was leaning toward becoming a pastor. Um, when I went to uh, Concordia there, I ended up taking some college classes, but I fell in love with science. I just love science. So I ate it up and uh, I ended up going to Augustana College in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, which was an American Lutheran, if you remember those days, uh, before they became the ELC uh, or before they joined forces. And uh, anyway, I went down the path of pre-med and went into physical therapy at uh, Mayo Clinic and uh, stayed in that really all my life. I transitioned to healthcare administration um, for probably the last 15 years um, in various areas like marketing, business administration, service excellence. And I consulted the last five years, but always retained my physical therapy license and uh, went back to school and got my doctorate in physical therapy late in uh, 2014. Uh, so I was still actively engaged with PT quite a bit while I was doing healthcare administration. Um, but anyway, um, like all of us, you know, felt a bit of a tug. I didn't have a burning bush, you know, in front of me. I didn't get an email or a text message, you know, except this call or think about it. It was just a, um, a real compelling drive um, you know, to make a switch. And uh, at the time I was working with a healthcare company in, uh, to, in that's out of Toledo called ProMedica and they had a base in Monroe. And uh, I was consulting down there and I was having an annually renewable contract and I was in my fifth year of that contract. And uh, they said, you know, it's been going well and all, but we're probably gonna now go it on our own. And I was helping with patient experience, things like that. And, um, and I, it just, you know, sort of at that time, I was 66, and I thought, man, you know, why don't I maybe jump on this? And my contract was going to be up in March. I applied mega late, like as we all know, you can apply in February to get into the SEMS. And I thought about it in the late December, applied in February uh, to both Fort Wayne and St. Louis seminaries. And uh, anyway, went that route, but it was a, honestly a fairly quick decision. It wasn't like I contemplated for years. I, I mean, it was much quicker than that. It was probably uh, uh, more pushed by knowing in maybe November that my contract would be up and thinking, do I want to retire or do I want to pursue something, you know, different or go after a different contract uh, in service excellence. I had formed a company called Center 3. It's now more centered on the Trinity, the three, but it was centered on patient experience, uh, clinical quality and uh, efficiency of care. And I, but I was, I say that as forming a company, I was a sole consultant. So I was me, myself, and I was really nothing. Um, uh, but anyway, it was uh, like, like you and probably many that are involved. Um, I had been a chairman of a congregation for a couple terms, had been like a chair of elders, chair of board of ed, chair of youth, you know, all of those things. And uh, got exposed to when we had a, a call process more recently, went through probably in my home congregation in Port Huron, probably three pastors during while I was there since 79. And I'd moved to Michigan for physical therapy. Um, and uh, while we were calling, the last pastor we brought in, uh, right before him, we had an interim pastor, interim intensive, and he was second career. So I remember chatting with him a little bit about it. He was in his 50s, and I thought, oh, that's sort of interesting. You know, and um, he would go in and, and try to uh, work on our performance excellence and get us mission focused again. And then our pastor came and he had uh, a couple times in his first year where he had um, absences where he couldn't make Sunday service. And so he wanted, I was an elder at the time. He said, you know, can you fill in? So I filled in and, and preached and I thought, you know, maybe I should think about this. And that was in my last year before my contract came up uh, with ProMedica. Um, so Ben and Josh, it was, it was simply that, you know, no text message, no burning bush, no email. Um, no direct conversation with God, but a, a compelling sense that, you know, I need to uh, and should uh, serve at a, at a more intensive level. Um, so anyway, I went that route and talked it over with my wife in pretty short order. And she, um, you know, was graciously willing to uproot. Um, so we did. And it's been a great experience. 
I have to say, especially the close to the ending of that story sounds a little familiar because like there are guys and we all met them while we were at the seminary together. Um, there are guys who they have that store, like they have someone in their life who is really pushing or, or they, there was, you know, yeah. there was a text or an email or whatever. Um, but my experience, it sounds like was much closer to yours where it was just like, this is kind of the decision in front of me and this is the right one. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a certainty there, but there's no, like, I can't point to, there's no quote burning bush. So, um, yeah, that strong sense, Josh, of feeling compelled to do it, you know, um, I'm, I'm with you, Josh. I think it was like October or November of my senior year of undergrad, father, Ted, who has been on the podcast at least once. Uh, we'll be again. We have him lined up for a few weeks from now. Beautiful. Um, Talking about the plagues. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Bill Reedy, Father Ted, uh, depending on how you know him, came by Valpo's campus and was like, so we're offering a little extra financial aid next year for the 500th anniversary of the Reformation if you get your paperwork in on time. And uh, I was like, what? I didn't see that. You got it. Everybody oh, well, did. I'll take your word for it. Okay. Um, anyway, so <laughs> Father Ted sent uh, or told me about this. I started the process then and there. I was like kind of starting to look at engineering jobs, um, but I hadn't had great experiences in the engineering world. And it was just like, all right, yeah. Yeah, let's do this. Um, and I think, I mean, even for us, there was something kind of already there it seems like if i'm speaking out of turn forgive me um but bryce you mentioned you had a pastor that was pushing you towards you know ministry or secondary ed from you know way 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 back oh yeah from elementary school days yep yeah and josh i know that your dad um whether you like it or not has been a significant influence on your life and uh his his devotion to church work and the way that he does that pretty faithfully um, I know that that was probably rattling around in your brain somewhere as you were thinking about this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. <Probably. laughs> we don't, you don't want to give him too much credit, but. <laughs> oh, I do. I, I'll both my mom and my dad, I'll give them all the credit in the world. I also found out red, like I didn't find this out until last year. I'm, if you're a little creative in how you count generations, I'm a fifth generation Lutheran pastor. Oh, wow. Well, you yeah. skip from one side of the family. Cause like my mom wasn't a Lutheran pastor. My dad was, but then my mom's dad was, but if you get a little creative in how you trace it, I'm a fifth generation guy. So that was cool wow. to discover. I didn't know that. Nice. That's so rather it significant. Be, it might be genetic. It might be genetics actually. It, <laughs> But, well, you uh, have some strong direct and indirect influencers in your life. That's that's the truth. Um, I was going to say though, as as we were looking at this, some of this text last week with with Connor. In Moses' background, it's unclear to us how much he was really instructed in the scriptures growing up. Yeah, because he grew up in Pharaoh's household. He then runs to Midian. Who knows what? god or gods jethro is actually a priest of it's not clear um and yet he hears this call of god and is willing to respond um and i think that's something that in some ways is commendable and in some ways is terrifying like stepping out in faith because you've heard a voice coming out of a bush um can you imagine explaining that to aaron on the way why are we going back to egypt again i talked to a bush yeah <laughs> right. sure you did brother <laughs> <laughs> okay. it, made me, it made me take my sandals off <laughs> did it also give you socks with grippy bottoms <laughs> uh. but to your point ben something I want to throw out 
to to the listeners of our podcast, especially if you've ever felt that kind of tug, whether it's to pastoral ministry, which we need them, there's yeah, a shortage no, and no. it's not getting better, uh, or to other forms of ministry, even if that's just to serve on a leadership team or to volunteer in a Sunday school or something at your church. Um, don't be overly worried about the qualifications. Like if you're wanting to be a pastor and the academics are what intimidate you, there, there is a certain level of fairness to that concern. But at the same time, um, they're not going to let you into the seminary if they don't genuinely believe that you can handle it. And the professors are very invested in making sure you get the information. You, you don't have to start that process with all this knowledge or all this information. Like that's that's what the four years of school is for. Um, and if you're like if you're thinking of the same thing in you know in a local service, you know you're trying to join a team. There are resources out there to give you like if if it's a skill or a knowledge issue, like we can we can teach, we can train those. Um, so if you're feeling the call like Moses did, and maybe you don't have the background that you think might be necessary, don't let that be the thing that stops you. I mean, reach out to try and fill those gaps, right? It's it's not okay to stay ignorant, but um, I would I, I would put your mind at ease if if you're worried that you don't know enough to serve. Let me. Yeah, that's well said, Josh. Uh, the uh, and even Moses said to God, uh, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? I mean, mm -hmm. come on, Lord. And, you know, we had a, he had a stuttering problem before he rested a little bit on Aaron to speak for him. But uh, um, And God essentially says, it doesn't matter who you are. It matters right. who you are. That, that's right. That's right. I think, and I, I, wanna, I want you guys to tell me how much you agree with this phrase, because there's like, there's obviously limitations to to things. Um, so nothing is a blanket universal statement um, other than Which is in and of itself a blanket universal statement. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, the phrase, and I'm sure you guys have heard it or heard something like it. Uh, God doesn't call the equipped. He equips those whom he calls. To what extent do you agree with that statement and where would you maybe caution that? So like if I'm a, if I'm a random listener sitting at home discerning, uh, did God actually tell me that I should step up in leadership at my local church? Um, what might be some red flags that, hey, maybe this isn't a word from God? And what would maybe be some green lights as to like, hey, yeah, pursue this. Yeah, you're sort of hitting on, if I may start out here, on the Go discernment process, right? You know, and we, we talk about discernment. How do we know if God's really directing me this? Well, we pray about it. Uh, we read the word. We, we get into scripture a bit. Uh, we meditate on it. And, um, and we act. And um, I think uh, on leadership roles in the church, um, you probably intuitively know if you have some degree of leading in you. Um, based on your past or your present. Um, and uh, and God works so eloquently with weaknesses. You know, even as we mentioned Moses, we think, you know, when we think of the Ten Commandments, the movie, you know, Charlton Heston, well, he was quite the stud. Uh, but he didn't stutter in the Ten Commandments, the movie. You know, Moses did. And and, uh, and yeah, he, he was privileged. He grew up in the house of Pharaoh. Yet, as you mentioned, Ben, we don't know, you know, what his real knowledge was of Hebrew scripture. Um, he may have been pretty light on it, you know, as he tried to lead the children of Israel. Um, but God obviously worked with them and he works with us in all our many frailties. But uh, I think there's value in stepping out of the boat, not to be a Peter um, who ended up, uh, you know, having a little bit of a gap in his faith there as he as he caught a little wind when he was walking toward Jesus. But but he did get out of the boat. Uh, he did make a move. And I think getting into leadership or getting into involvement in the church is um, is worth praying about. Um, but it's also worth acting on, you know, and um, and part of it is just to get involved and and pray to God to help you lead and to help shore up any gaps you may feel 
that you have in yourself because uh, he will do that. Yeah, I, I think you're nailing you're nailing it on the head um, when you say the God doesn't call the equipped; He equips the call. I think the called. I think there's truth to that statement, but I'm also a firm believer in the statement that might not sound quite right, but I still believe it to be true that um, just loving Jesus isn't enough mm -hmm. in that. And here's an example. If you want to serve in youth ministry, right? You want to, you want to lead youth group or you want to help volunteer with youth group, but you have absolutely no ability to connect with kids and no awareness of uh, their culture and the kinds of things they're engaging with and, and what they're like, you can't have a conversation with a, a high schooler. Uh, just because you love Jesus doesn't isn't enough for you to serve in that role. Now, don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying you can't serve in that role, but I'm saying that maybe we need to do some equipping first. Mm -hmm. So kind of to, to trace this out as I see it, and I think I heard a little bit of this in, in your your response, Bryce, is there's this call. And whether that comes through a text or an email or someone speaking in your life, or it's just this, this thing you know in your gut, you have this, and there is a call to action, but before you get to this action, maybe there is a middle step. Like if you're feeling called to pastoral ministry, you don't just wake up one Sunday and you go preach, right? Mm -hmm. in, in our church, there's a four-year step that you have to take first. Um, well, if you can get it down to shorten that, but generally there's a four-year step. Um, if you want to volunteer for youth ministry and you don't have that skill, you might need to, to go to your pastor or go to someone and acquire some skills to connect with youth. Uh, if you want to lead a Bible study, you might have to spend some time learning before you can step into that leader. So like there, there's a middle step of preparation and then there is a call to action um, because it's not an idle thing. And when you're in that first step and you're discerning that call, what I tell people on knowing what, Ben, to your original question, what I have told people in my limited wisdom is that God is not going to lead you alone in the wrong decision. Mm. I, I had, uh, I was having a conversation with someone, um, and this actually can apply to a couple of conversations I've had. So if you're listening to this and you think, hey, that's me, it might have been, but in any case, they were deciding between going to seminary and then they had they had one or more options ahead of them they were deciding on their route not necessarily like not their route at seminary like seminary or something else and what i've told them is make a decision one way or the other make your call and sleep on it and if in the next morning you have a pit in your gut, if you have this uncomfortable feeling of you're still not sure this is the right decision, well, someone might be trying to say something to you. But if you wake up the next morning and the morning after that, and you are at peace with your decision, and there, there's not really any thought in your mind of like, oh, I don't know, you're probably on the right track. Because God's not going to give you that kind of peace if you're making a decision that goes against his will. And that's not like, you can't nail that down. You can't put that in a checklist, but. Um, I think that kind of goes into what, what I've been thinking about though, is like, you need to have the like maturity in your faith to match what you're getting into. Like, if you just got into Christianity in the last year, chances are you're not prepared to teach Bible study or go to seminary or um, be an elder or, um, you know, some of these more, like, experience and, and knowledge-heavy kind of tasks. You might be really well-equipped with, some soft skills that or or hard skills that you picked up along the way um 
Maybe you have a background in finance and you can help us the church treasurer. Um, maybe you've got a, a good sense of organization and you can be the person that helps put together events at the church. Um, maybe you're an artist and you want to just create beautiful things for the, your worship space. Like there are great ways to engage in the skills that God has given you. Even if your faith isn't at a point where you're like looking at the, the, the primary ways that we set up for people to serve or lead in their church and you're just not there yet. And that's like, that's okay. At some point we are all growing in our faith and we're all gaining the knowledge required to do what God is calling us to do. So don't, feel bad about being in the season of life that you're in. Um, shoot, I had something else. <laughs> train left the station and Ben wasn't on it. <laughs> um, the train was trying to go in two different directions at once and it drove far, far enough away that he lost <laughs> sight of the other one. Um, that was a really bad analogy. I'm sorry for that one. It's fine. Looking for the smokestack over the mountains. <laughs> Something like that. Um, <sighs> well, while Ben is is rummaging through the chaotic mess that is his own brain, um, <laughs> a question for you, Bryce, because yeah. I imagine this is something that you maybe wrestled with a little bit more than either of us would have, but kind of when you're taking that call, how strong is that voice of, I don't want to uproot my family. Uh, I don't know. And I'm not going to ask because that's not polite, but I assume that work in consulting and or physical therapy pays better than being a pastor. Um, so there's that. I don't know if I want to take the pay cut. I don't know if I want to leave. I don't know if I want to live in St. Louis on purpose for that many years. Like, how strong are those other voices when when you're contemplating something like this? Uh, that's actually a good question. And uh, they were all there. All those other voices were were there. You know, um, uh, yeah, I'm just thinking of some of the conversations I had with my kids and who are all adults, um, but still leaving the state and and wondering, am I going to get called back to the state? You know, what are you doing? You know, have you really lost it, Dad? I mean, I got that. I mean, really, are you serious? I mean, if I were you, I'd be retiring. You know, why aren't you doing something like that or get another consulting gig? Why don't you keep doing that? Uh, yes, it was economically much more advantageous in the prior professions. Um, and uh, the uprooting, um, you know, going to St. Louis, uh, I don't know. We didn't really find that too hard. Um, we sold our home, uh, got rid of it, kept the little pole barn in Michigan thinking we might come back, you know, cause you at least, you, at least seminary allows you when you're during the call process to select a potential district as your first choice. So obviously we selected the Michigan district, but, um, uh, but, but it tugged, it, it tugged more on probably uh life stage things. Like uh, I think my one son had a couple grandkids or we have a couple grandkids, five-year-old, just like you might have little kids, uh, but a five-year-old and a two-year-old. And, uh, um, are you going to be able to spend time with them? Why aren't you grandparenting them, putting really in mega time with them to help nurture them instead of going off on another tangent on another career? Um, as noble as you might perceive it to be. Um, so, yeah, all those things honestly did tug, Josh and Ben. They did. Um, economically, um, that, that didn't really um, in that standpoint. And maybe it's at the life stage I was at um, or am at. Um, I wasn't really concerned on that. I, I felt that uh, um, that original pastor, Martin Borneman, that planted a seed way long, long time ago, you know, when I was in elementary school, I mean, that one um, just sort of sprouted up and tugged at me and overtook all the other concerns. And uh, so I'm maybe not explaining it very well, but all those voices were present, you know, on, on concerns. Um, and uh, especially moving out of state are or maybe not retiring or doing something like that, you know, and just serving in the church uh, versus trying to go into the ministry. And when I went into the ministry, I didn't want to go in it for two years. So I tried to want to try to commit for a decade. So that takes me a little bit deep in life um, from an age standpoint, but um, um, 
the tug obviously was much more biased toward you think of some others who have served, um, uh, you know, the sacrifices others have made. It just seems so minute the little bit I'm doing. Um, not trying to sound like a martyr or anything. It's just that uh, um, when the need to serve really tugs at you, um, you know, you just want to sort of say yes. And that's where I ended up. And uh, I was just so blessed that my wife was so compliant because I really uprooted her. I mean, she had a job. She was, uh, she's 15 years my younger. Uh, she's my second wife. I'd lost my first wife at about age 46 uh, to cancer. And um, um, anyway, so she had to uproot jobs, and, and a, you know, and a much bigger uprooting than I think mine was. I think but she, she looks back and it's, it's all honestly, she would say all for the good. Go ahead, Ben. Sorry. No, it's okay. I, I think something that you're kind of hinting at, and I remembered this was back to what I was going to say to you or to your point there, Josh. Um, when we're in that discernment process, so many times as uh, I'd say modern day comfortable Christians, we want God to just give us like this blinking neon sign with an answer of like, Here's what you're mm. supposed to do. Um, and so many times in scripture, God doesn't give that answer. <laughs> Somebody steps out in faith and then God either like gives them a smack across the proverbial or literal smack across the face and says no, or like gives them a, a commendation for their faithful action. Um, I think of oh, Balaam uh, on the negative sense, the, the donkey like, what are you doing, fool? There's an angel with a sword in front of me. <laughs> right. Like, the, right. no. Um, and then on the flip side, you've got someone like, um, oh, why am I blanking on his name? Hezekiah, who prays to God for deliverance, but also, like, does some things to care for the people in the meantime. And God sees, like, he's trying to faithfully serve his people. I'm going to bless him in this circumstance and help him evade you know, the, the certain demise of, of Jerusalem. And like for you, it wasn't necessarily God killed thousands of your enemies surrounding your gates to, to, to like affirm your decision, but you stepped out in faith to go to St. Louis and God has now shown you through your wife and, and her acknowledging, Hey, this was a blessing in the end. And I think, you know, having talked to you a few times at pastors conferences at thing and things I see in you that you, you perceive this to be a blessing and God has uh, shown you some pretty cool stuff through your time, um, both as a, a vicar and a pastor now and uh, throughout seminary too. And I feel like Josh and I can kind of echo some of those sentiments where like, oh, I'm sure you can, that there was some doubt heading in, and uh, eventually it was like, yeah, no, this is where I need to be. Um, I, I took a step that might have seemed stupid at some point, but I'm still here. And God is using me to do some fun things. Josh, you yeah, smiled sure, and yeah. laughed. <laughs> I smiled and laughed because I had one of my earliest interactions with my, my brother's fiance uh i was on speakerphone with them and they might not even remember this conversation but she said oh the stupid one because <laughs> she had been made aware that coming out of undergrad i had a job offer from the nashville predators ice hockey team to run ooh, some sticks ooh. right which this job would have, first of all, starting six figures out the gate yeah. with the job requirement of having to go to every single Nashville Predators game. <laughs> oh, honey, what a hard job, right? I get to run numbers and watch hockey intently for a living and get paid really well. Like, so she made the joke, this is a stupid one who chose to go do pastoral ministry instead of that, right? So that's why I was laughing. But what I want to say, because kind of what you're, what to kind of distill 
what both of you have been talking about here is there are a lot when you're discerning something like a call, whether that's a call to ministry or a call to step up in a leadership or like whatever vocation we're talking about here. There are going to be a lot of voices speaking in your ears, literally and metaphorically. Um, and it's important to listen to them because you never know which voice God is going to use, right? It might be an internal thing. Maybe he's going to use a friend or a scripture or a, a sermon or a stranger to talk to you. But what we need to be careful of, because God's not the only one who speaks, mm -hmm. right? I think what's important to remember is where's the voice coming from? And Bryce, I'm glad that you said these weren't huge concerns because it means I can kind of uh, tear at them a little bit and not feel not feel bad about it. But like the money thing. Yeah. If, if money is a huge, if, if you're like, ah, I might be a pastor. Oh, but I, I, that's financially not a great prophet. Like you're not going to get rich doing it. Um, I would encourage you. Where's that? Is that coming from a, cause on one hand, maybe it's coming from a faithful place and you're like, I need to make sure I can take care of my family. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Maybe that's a fair voice to listen to. But if you're like, no, nah, I really like these luxuries I have, or I'm kind of greedy and I want to make sure my bank account number looks not like, or it's mm -hmm. a status thing. And if that voice is coming from one of those places, I, I would say to you, that is probably not God speaking. God is not speaking through your greed or through your desire for leisure or whatever that is. Um, and I think that the same can be said of a lot of other voices, right? Uh, and you got to discern where's where's this voice coming from? What kind of character is this voice speaking with? Because with that kind of filter, a lot of a lot of these calls, we can say, well, that voice that's that's cautioning me against taking this call, maybe it's coming from a place uh, that is not holy. Um, mm -hmm. No, that's well said, Josh, and quite true. Um, and I'm sure as now for both of you, I have a question for you guys. Since you, as you've been in the ministry, uh, what kind of self doubts have creeped in possibly have any? <laughs> <laughs> All of them. Yeah. 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 Oh man. I have a really bad habit of in the absence of feedback, I assume the negative. <laughs> okay. so if no one steps in and tells me that I'm good at what I do. I'm going to assume, oh, I'm I'm pretty sure I'm a terrible preacher. I'm pretty sure I can't teach. I don't think I have a handle on any of this. I'm not leading this. Oh, yeah. So uh, you name it. If it's a part of ministry, I have questioned myself uh, doing it. And mm -hmm. in like a deep existential middle school angsty kind of way. So, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I think for me, it's I'm in a context where I'm kind of a Timothy. I'm not a teenager leading a bunch of adults, but I'm 28 and my congregation, say half of them are probably over the age of 70. Um, we've got a number of young families now, too, that I got uh, kind of offset. You, ben. What? Make sure to make jokes about how you graduated high school in 2013. Yeah. People love that. People love to be reminded of how recently you graduated high school. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely haven't gotten death threats about doing stuff like that. Oh, yeah. I no, I, I definitely said like a year or two ago in a sermon, like 10 years ago, when I was learning how to drive. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, gotten similar pushback for that. Um, but I think at times it can be hard for... Um, some in my community to to take me entirely seriously and this is not speaking like negatively of them i'm the same age as many of their their grandkids um yeah. and they see the lives of their grandkids and they they have a hard time imagining like somebody the same age is responsible and yet if we look back at what they were doing 
when they were my age, these are the older folks in our congregations. Um, there's a retired pastor in my congregation who I'm pretty sure was uh, reaching the end of his teaching career before he entered seminary. Um, like he was about to, to switch jobs and, and head into seminary. Uh, I know of people who, when they were my age, had two or three kids, were working full-time jobs um, and supporting their families and doing other things on the side. Um, like, to me, I think the biggest kind of self-doubt piece is just like, do they actually respect me? Do they take oh. me seriously? Um and I think this kind of goes with the, the problem that many churches have where pastors can preach the greatest and most eloquent sermons possible in the world. But if we don't see heart change, it's pretty defeating. And I think that can also then wear into the, the like, am I actually supposed to be doing this or am I just kind of a joke piece of things? Yeah yeah but like to to provide something else though when moses was considering his call the voice that he went to to like affirm this was his father-in-law jethro somebody he trusted somebody who he considered wise mm -hmm. and what's jethro's response go in peace and so if you have somebody that you trust somebody that's full of wisdom that's affirming this call that's affirming this route that is like encouraging you even if like it's one voice that you trust encouraging you against a hundred voices that are like mm, don't know about this like that one voice might be all you need fair enough yeah and i ask because you know um it doesn't matter what age you're at um, we all have self-doubts. I have plenty of mm -hmm. mine too. And where I contemplate, man, I like golf when you brought up golf before. And I love <laughs> hunting. I'm like a hunting maniac. I mean, if I had my druthers. And so you start to think, oh, you know, you do find out in the ministry, you don't exactly have a lot of Every free time, time <laughs> uh, to say the least. I mean, it's amazing how many hours you can put in. And uh, so, yeah, there are a lot of pulls, aren't there? Uh, both ministerial pulls on your doubting yourself and uh and whether it's feedback josh or lack thereof you know um and then tugs as um the what ifs what if i wasn't doing this would i have more time for grandkids would i have more time for my kids would i have more time for avocational pursuits sort of those selfish things that creep in um at times two yeah. two words fun meeting <laughs> that's how you get more golfing <laughs> there you go there you go i was wondering where you were going with that um i think at this point in the show we're probably ready for takeaways is that am i reading this reading the I think room? so uh um, i did not warn him ahead of time so good on, good on we're brand keeping with tradition then he did he did maybe listen to an episode though yeah. rip oh well anyway so at this point in the show we're gonna we're gonna do some takeaways and and bryce just to to warn you now for the thing we're about to ask you for um if you had to summarize or distill this episode into one piece of logic or if there's just one thread you really want people to hold on to from our conversation today what would that thing be um i think um uh, pray about how you can serve the lord um and you know as we happen to be in the ministry here but um pray for discernment you know in your life whatever your vocation happens to be Whatever your calling is, life, whatever your types of roles in life, as Martin Luther would say, happen to be. I mean, how can you serve and, you know, use the gifts that God gave you, the talents that you happen to possess um, all from him um, toward growing the kingdom? Um, and um, and if it's ministry, you know, please prepare yourself and, and pursue it. And uh, I'm biased toward action, um, but I agree with what you said, Josh, of course, and and Ben in your color commentary. I mean, we need to have preparation. Um, but I think a uh, uh, key takeaway is, is look for, you know, search for discernment in your life and how you can really 
um, work to be involved in ministry in whatever capacity that is. Josh, you want to go next? Sure. You need more time? Uh, mine's a pretty simple one, and that is I'm going to speak specifically to any of the young men who listen to this podcast uh, because I referenced this earlier. There is a pastoral shortage uh, across Christianity in America, but the LCMS is feeling it. And it's it's not fixing to get better. We have, if you look at the statistics, we have a lot of guys that are right on the edge of retirement. Um, so young men, well, men of any age, but especially young men, uh, if you have felt this call, give it serious consideration because the church needs you. Mm -hmm. um, especially if this is where your talents lie. If you are good at connecting with people, if you are good at reading where people are and what, what scripture has for them, um, because you've been in the church long enough to, to have a good feel for that. Consider, <laughs> consider this your burning bush. And, mm -hmm. Well, maybe I shouldn't speak that highly of us. Uh, <laughs> Maybe this is, for you, a burning bush. Maybe this is your neon flashing sign to think about this kind of stuff and to consider to consider calling up the seminary and headed that way. So that's my takeaway for you. Well, for some of you. <laughs> I think to make this more general in, in, in scope, if you're waiting for God to tell you where you should act, just do something. And God will let you know if you're wrong. That can be uncomfortable at times. Um, but if if you're if you pick something that you're equipped to do, um maybe you need to grow into the the faith required for some of the things that you're you're trying to accomplish. But like, man, you've got the the soft skills, the hard skills down. Just do it. Seek out advice from uh, older, wiser Christians. Seek out advice from your pastor. Um, seek out what advice from uh, the many, 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 many resources that have been created throughout the years for people who are looking to step up in ways they can serve their church. And just do it. Um, do it! Yeah. Don't let your dreams be dreams. Um to the three people who understood that reference. Thank oh, you. Surely more than three people got that <laughs> reference. Um, I hope. <laughs> Maybe I don't hope. In any case, uh, Bryce, is there anything that you would like to, uh, to plug to take this opportunity to advertise? I know you said that someone at your school is starting a podcast soon. You can feel yeah. to plug that. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't. Uh, we're going to do it on uh, reading through the Bibles, where we're going to start out on uh, you know three year stint. Uh, we're breaking into eight week segments, and we're going to have podcasts. that are going to sort of talk about the different books of the Bible as we're going through it. Haven't even framed it well yet, so I don't have much to plug other than we're going to try to launch something at the beginning of the year. Um, when we see thank you for up, asking. When we see that come up, we will somehow link it in a yeah or something somewhere. Beautiful. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. So Can I ask uh, Josh? This is a side question, but who is that Martinez jersey belong to that's hanging uh, up behind you? Uh, well, the physical jersey is mine. The I meant to. Uh, <laughs> as it's referring to, <laughs> yeah. is Joseph Martinez, who formerly played for Atlanta United. Now he's with Inter Miami, and I'm not thrilled about that. But and it is signed, so that's pretty. That's why it's framed. Very yeah. nice. Um, some, some personal shameless plugs before we get to the show's shameless plugs, uh, myself and Ryan Mazur, who's been on the show before as well. Um, actually just this morning, this went live. We have published a Bible study series on, it's a survey of scripture. I think it's like 28, 26 or 28 weeks of oh, good. lessons and discussions. Um, so if you're listening to this and you are part of a group or a church who's, who's looking for a study. Um, go ahead and check it out. See if it's something that would fit what you're looking to do. Uh, physical copies of the book are $10 on Amazon. 
uh, digital co like Kindle copies are five dollars. And the easiest way to find it is to either search Joshua Laborious or search Ryan Mazur on Amazon. If you search Survey of Scripture, there is a lot of stuff that comes up, and it all comes up before our uh, our newly published book with zero purchases. So. And Mazer is spelled M-A-S-E-R. There's not a bunch of superfluous vowels to find. Yeah, Ryan so. Mazer is probably the easier name. <laughs> of the um, but with that, uh, That's great. we do want to shamelessly plug the podcast. Go ahead and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. Uh, YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Google, Pandora. We're on all the big ones. Um and if you have a topic for us, if you have a guest you'd like us to try and, and get on, we're happy for those suggestions. We have actually planned this season a little bit. I know it's it's shocking, but we did it. Um, so if you have a suggestion that doesn't fit into the season, unless we're really interested, it might be a minute before we get there. But we'd still love to get it. If you know us personally, just shoot us a text. If you don't know us personally, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, we hope that we don't offend you too deep, deeply. And uh, we have a Facebook page that you can message and we can get, uh, we'll, we'll see the message there. That's, that's what it's there for. Um, it doesn't post a lot. It, we check it occasionally, but it is there for you to reach out to us. And finally, if you know someone who may be dealing with feeling a call and, and going back and forth on that, maybe go ahead and send them this podcast and maybe it'll be something that is helpful to them as well. So with all that, this has been Man Buns and Jesus. We're so happy you took the time out of your, your day to listen to us. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you.